Welcome to the Endwise Community Hour. My name is Varun Verma, uh, the internal medicine hospitalist, co-founder of Endwise, and we have our director of education and empowerment, Tanya Frias, with us today. Hello, good evening. And the past few community hours, we've talked about creating a financial plan, working with a financial advisor and a couple of other topics, everything's interrelated. Today, we thought we would talk about retirement plans and accounts and what options you have. Because most of us, a lot of times, if we're employees of an organization, we just pick whatever the organization has. And that's great. But there's also some other options out there, particularly if you have some side gigs or if you have any independent contractor income coming in. It's lots of different plans. I'll let Tanya lead the discussion. I want to start by saying, obviously, retirement planning is very important. All of us need to do that. And the sooner you start, the better. However, I do want you all to consider not only saving for retirement, but how does it fit into your whole picture? I don't really recommend folks maxing out retirement accounts and sacrificing things like emergency savings things like other type of liquid assets that you have access to in cases of emergency or to purchase a home. Because once you start tapping into these retirement accounts, it's really hard to recoup whatever growth you've missed out. And there's also pretty nasty penalties if you start taking out of your retirement account. This is why this always falls back to our earlier meeting about creating a financial plan and why it's important. If you have an idea of what your larger picture is, and what you're trying to accomplish, there's a way to have balance and contribute towards retirement, contribute towards your savings, contribute towards individual goals. The reason why I say that is because in all my years working as a client-facing planner, I've come across a number of physicians that maxed out their retirement accounts, of course, but then had very little outside of that to cover emergency expenses. A lot of these folks are obviously business owners and the amount of liquidity you need to have to keep your business stable is a a good amount. I've seen in the past people who had tons of money in their retirement accounts, but this money just wasn't too accessible to them or would cost them a lot of money to take it out. And it was mostly because around tax time, obviously people don't want to paying a large amount of taxes. And of course, what is your accountant going to tell you? Hey, if you contribute to this account or contribute as much as possible to reduce your tax bill. And that's an, a really good strategy if you planned it out before. So if you're taking all your cash and throwing it into these accounts to reduce your taxes, but at the same time, sacrificing your day-to-day liquidity or security, that's probably not a good idea. Definitely big picture. But back to retirement accounts, there are a couple of sets of accounts that are pretty common. The IRA, the individual retirement account, those accounts were set up so that folks could save for retirement on their own. The limits are not very high. It's around 6,500 for an individual under 50 years old. Once you're over 50, you can add on an extra thousand dollars to try to catch up. The contribution limits are not really high, which is why you hear a lot about 403Bs, 1K accounts who have higher contribution limits, and then at the super high end um, pension plans, which are pretty common amongst physicians as well if they don't have a ton of employees. The IRA account will work exactly like any other investment account. You can purchase stocks, mutual funds, ETFs. They could be managed um, by an investment advisor. There's a lot of options inside of them. The difference is is that these accounts are designated for retirement, which means that if you take distributions out prior to the age of 59 and a half, there's a 10% penalty. Plus, you pay taxes at your individual tax rate. For example, if you're in a 35% tax bracket and you take money out before you're 59 and a half, you're going to owe that distribution, 45% of that will go to the IRS. So it's very, pretty punitive if you take money out sooner than later. Back to the traditional IRA. 
when you contribute to these accounts, you get a tax deduction. Um, and the idea behind these accounts is that while you're in your working years, it's perceived that you're in a higher tax bracket than you are when you're retired. So when you take the money out, while you get a deduction for contributions, you pay taxes on all the distributions. Nowadays, I haven't seen it in practice that people are at lower um, income tax brackets when they're in retirement. Um, these traditional accounts, they have their own tax liability when it's time to distribute. The next type of account is the Roth account, which is the awesome account. You don't get a tax deduction for contributing. However, those funds do grow tax-free. And when you are ready to take distributions after 59 and a half as well, that money comes out tax-free. There isn't a tax benefit when you're contributing, but there's certainly a very large tax benefit when you're distributing these accounts. There's another thing about Roth that if you contribute money into the account and you do not take distributions within the five, first five years, and if you do need to take money out of the account, you will pay the penalty if it's prior to the five years, but after you won't pay a penalty. Sometimes I see Roth structured as like the backup to an emergency savings. That's when people are getting creative with their uh, retirement plans. The other thing about Roth accounts, they do have income limits. If you make under the annual limit, it changes, it goes up with inflation every year. You have it up, Dr. Verma? Yes, awesome. So if you make, that is for married. If you are a couple and you make over 218, you're not able to um, contribute to these accounts. If you're a single and you make over somewhere between 138 and 153, um, you won't be able to contribute. Below 138 is for the single. I think it's the third one up from the bottom. And you're right, it phases out between 138 yeah. and 153. The phase out just means that you won't be able to contribute the maximum. So once you reach 153, you won't be able to contribute at all. But if you're somewhere in the middle, they'll just prorate it and so it may be that you're able to contribute 3,000 as opposed to 6,500, something along those lines. Both IRA, these type of accounts, Roth and traditional, they were really put together so that folks can start putting money away on their own for retirement, history of retirement plans, if, just in case you guys are not going to get bored in the next two minutes. <laughs> Years ago, people had pension plans. Companies, organizations wanted to help employees save for retirement. I believe somewhere around the 1970s, Kodak decided that this is eating at their revenue and did not want to do that anymore. And they lobbied the government to um, create these sort of individual accounts to defer the risk of retirement to individuals, hence the K in the back of 401k. Um, these accounts were set up for people to do that um, for sure on their own. They are used in financial planning in all kinds of ways but the traditional way is just you contribute funds to these accounts and you do it consistently and then you'll have a nice retirement plan when you're ready to retire the other type of account that most of you are familiar with is either 401k or 403b the difference between the two is that the 403b is usually administered by hospitals schools Usually nonprofit organizations as well are able to open 403Bs. They're very similar to 401Ks, except that 401Ks are usually issued by traditional companies for the employees so they can um, save for retirement. Sometimes there's a match, um, which just means your employer will match your contributions dollar for dollar up to a certain amount. Some are more generous with that than others. Rule of thumb, if you're getting a match, please contribute at least up to that match. It is, if you don't do it, it's literally like throwing money away, free money. If your employer contributes up to 3%, try to um, contribute at least that amount. So that way you have a steady 6% going into your retirement account every single year. Um, 401ks and 403bs have gotten very fancy lately. Some of them have traditional and Roth options, which are awesome or they have 
non-tax deductible options, which just means that, especially if you're a high earner, you'll get to contribute to both buckets. The part where you are getting a tax deduction for it, so lowering your taxable income, the traditional 401k side, and they also allow you to um, contribute to the part where you don't get a tax deduction, which is just another word for a non-deductible contribution. And the reason why those are cool is because you get to then turn those into Roth accounts, even though you're over the limit. We will go into more detail what a backdoor Roth IRA is, because that's top of mind for a lot of folks. But sometimes your employer does have this extra me mechanism in your 401k or 403b that allows you to do it, which makes it a lot simpler when you do convert it to a Roth account. There's two other types of accounts that you hear about less often, which are defined benefit and defined contribution plans. So technically a 401k, 403b, those are defined contribution plans. There's a set contribution that you need to or that you can use every single year. So this is the amount that you can contribute to each plan. And that's how they're structured. The, the pension plan is a defined benefit plan. What that means is that there's actuarial assumptions and the plan needs to be funded to have a target distribution for each participant during retirement. Hence the idea when people have pension plans, they have a steady annual income, usually till they pass away or for a certain amount of time. Those are set up so that way that sort of distribution is guaranteed. It's all the reason why you don't see it very often because it's very expensive. You must contribute to a defined benefit plan or a pension plan every single year. Now, it has all these ties and this pressure because you need to contribute. However, it gives you this biggest tax benefit when you're making these contributions. High earners especially folks who have um, their own businesses and don't have a ton of employees, love pension plans because they can really put a lot of money away for retirement. The reason why I mention not too many employees because you cannot have a pension plan for yourself if you have employees. Your employees need to be able to participate in that plan. There's all sorts of rules around it. They're definitely more expensive to implement and to contribute to in the long term, but they also give you the biggest bang for your buck because you're, you're putting away a lot more money. I think for most people, like during residency, as you said, it's pretty hard to max out your contributions. Most residents earn between 50 and 70K, depending on what part of the country you live in and what PGY2 level you are. The annual contribution limit of 22,500 of a 401k in concept sounds like a really good idea, but probably as a resident, you might not be able to do that. Yeah. It's, it's uh, okay if you're not able to do that. Yeah. This is why I made that comment about your full plan and making sure yeah. um, you're covering all the areas. And, and like you were saying, taking the match is great because if your employer offers like a 3% or 5% of your salary match, what that means is if you put in 3 or 5% of your salary, then the employer will put in the same amount. Some people um, don't even contribute to the 401k. They just open up their own Roth IRA because they're under that contribution limit of whatever it yep. was we pulled up a second ago, the $153,000 mm -hmm. as a single income earner. And that money then is whatever the gains are compounded over the next how many ever years. There's, there's absolutely no tax on that because you've already paid tax on that money. It's post-tax money, right? The Roth IRA money. Yes. And the one thing I do want to point out is that these rules change all the time. Yeah. There was a lot of outrage a couple of years ago because Peter Thiel, the guy who founded PayPal, funded through the backdoor process a Roth IRA account with his shares of PayPal. And obviously now he has a tax-free $5 billion account. It's not put together for that, but that's the idea. He was able to put stock in this account that was practically worthless when they were issued and all that growth and all those gains over how many years is now available to him tax-free. I also wanted to touch on that with retirement accounts, 
they're an important part of your investing strategy, meaning that there are certain types of investments that are better suited for your retirement account than they are for your taxable investment account. Things that spit out a lot of interest or that you think will be a high growth um, position should go into high growth positions, definitely go into Roth accounts. Income producing positions go into your traditional IRA account. Um, and the reason why is because let's say you have a bond um, that pays you 5% interest and it's in your regular investment account, you're going to pay taxes on that interest every single year. Um, however, if it's in your retirement account, you're not getting a 1099 for that income that's earned there. Having these type of accounts um, and structuring your investments the right way become really important because can you imagine having um, tax-free interest for X amount of years as opposed to paying taxes on that interest while it's in a taxable um, investment account? Positioning your investments become really important when you have these type of accounts. There's this concept of a tax triangle, which is the idea that you want to leverage the tax code as much as possible for your investments. At the top of that tax triangle is, are your traditional investments, the accounts that you pay taxes on as you're receiving dividends, interest, capital gains. The other part is uh, tax deferral. It's the idea of the traditional IRA account, the traditional four way. 401k account. So any investment account or retirement account in which you're getting a tax deduction for contributions. And then the other part of that triangle is just a tax free. Roth fits in that category. There are certain investments that fit in that category, like municipal bonds. Um, but taking advantage of all three parts of that tax triangle really helps you in the long run when it comes to your financial plan in general. So not just retirement, just your long-term financial goals, but there's positioning your investments the right way and having those three different types of accounts is important. I touched on before is that these laws change all the time. Congress gets mad all the time about <laughs> what's being done or not being done with um, retirement accounts. And there's a big push um, to specifically revamp the backdoor IRA process. Roth IRA process, just because it's a big tax advantage for folks who know how to use it properly, and they just feel that it wasn't built for that. So take advantage of these types of accounts. Certainly work with a professional, whether it be a financial planner, for sure your tax advisor, if you're going to go through the process of a backdoor Roth IRA, which I'll touch on right now. As we mentioned, the Roth I IRA accounts have limits, income limits. If you make over X amount of dollars, you're not going to be able to contribute to these accounts. However, it's a huge advantage in the long run to have this tax-free account. The backdoor IRA is not a type of account. It's a strategy. And it becomes really important that if you don't understand it completely, get help because you could really mess it up and have a tax bill. Not every financial advisor knows how to do this correctly. Your accountant certainly does. But having help and advice when you do this becomes really important. This is a strategy. The strategy is for someone who is a high earner and cannot make these normal $6,500 contribu contributions to a Roth IRA account, you would open a traditional IRA account but make non-deductible contribution. What that means is that you're going to put money into this account, but you're not going to take a tax deduction for this contribution. This is really important that the account that you use to do the backdoor Roth IRA is has only contributions that are not, that you have not deducted. For example, when you switch jobs and you had a 403B or 401k at that job, it's normal for you to want to roll that over into an IRA account and continue investing however you see fit. However, that money is tax deductible money. You've received a tax deduction for those contributions. You don't want to commingle the two type of contributions at all in the same account ever. 
it becomes a very big tax headache if you do. Step one, you would open a traditional IRA account, but you'd make contributions that you did not have a tax deduction on. Step two, you would then convert that account, that non-deductible IRA account to a Roth account. It's a backdoor way of getting this Roth account and getting tax-free growth going forward. This is a little bit of a pain because you're limited to these like $6,500 contributions per year if you do it every single year. Let's say you have $100 in this traditional IRA that you did not take any deductions for, then you could convert that whole thing into a Roth. There's another rule that makes it a little bit complicated, um, which affects everyone usually who tries to do this. If you have, hi. Hi, uh, this is, might be more of a philosophical question, but why does this exist? <laughs> I know that it is a backdoor for a reason, but I'm not entirely sure why so weird steps. It exists because it's a loophole. It's just a hole that Congress did not realize. It's just a way for this to be done that they didn't realize was possible. That's why I said it's not a type of an account, it's a strategy. A lot of people also can't do it. The first couple of years of my career, I, I like kept changing jobs every year. I worked at UCSF, then Brigham. So each of those companies had a 403B. So I accumulated, let's just say $10,000 at one, $15,000 at another. Year three, when I got a real job, quote unquote, I had to decide, do I just leave that money lying around at Brigham and UCSF? And I was like, no, let me open a individual, an IRA, a traditional IRA, and roll over that money into an IRA. So now that I have that traditional IRA, year four, if I wanted to do some sort of backdoor strategy, the government actually doesn't let me do that without first converting that money, which is sitting in that traditional IRA, to a Roth. What that means is that, let's say Dr. Verma had a million dollars total in retirement accounts, right? Just as an example. And he had $100,000 that he wanted to convert to the Roth account. That's 10% of his total. 10% of that $100,000 has to come from the traditional IRA side, the side that he got a tax deduction on, and he would have to pay taxes on that portion. The bigger the percentages are, the more you have to start taking out from the traditional side, which means it's no longer a tax-free transaction. You have to start paying taxes. This is why I really emphasize that if you're going to do this, make sure you get the right help because the consequences are tax liability or having to put it back. That happens as well. Um, And not everyone is well-versed in it or knows how to do it. But getting help is going to be important. And your accountant does have to file um, specific paperwork when you do it. Letting your accountant know that you want to do this and how is going to be important as well. Most people who have this top of mind are folks who are above these income limits and usually have, you know, a set of retirement accounts already. They may have an account that they were contributing to and not receiving tax deductions, um, which is rare, but it does happen. Those are the folks who really have it top of mind. And it's also because they want to take advantage of that triangle, diversify their tax situation. That way, when there are changes in the future, they're not um, as impacted as someone who didn't do this type of planning in the past. This is why I I emphasize that things change all the time. And I know that especially with the news coming out with Peter Thiel doing what he did, this is a strategy that's being highlighted by Congress and they don't like it. He was only able to do it because he was like the co-founder of some billion dollar company. Yeah, it's a most startup. Of us, <laughs> most of us, as you said, are only able to, the best case scenario is every year we're able to squirrel away like 6,500, right? In the Roth IRA. and in No, the- but you, you're right. You're absolutely right that It is a backdoor strategy that wealthy people do take advantage of. They're just patient with it. And they will do things exactly like Peter Thiel did, which is put a very low price position in it, high growth potential. 
because these are folks who are not thinking about that money anyway. So if it does grow and become worth a billion dollars, awesome. They made a good decision, but I don't think they're thinking about it really on a day-to-day basis the way we would. So for, for most of us, since we don't know what the future tax brackets are like, it sounds like you need a mix of all three of these types of accounts, right? In the triangle. Yes, we do. The other thing that goes in there on the tax-free are things like municipal bonds, but that's a different conversation. Those are just bonds at the interest, especially if it's a, it's a bond that was issued within your state that you don't pay interest on. These things are going to become more and more attractive because interest rates have gone up tremendously. They were pretty boring investments for the past 10 years when interest rates are really low. Even if it was tax-free, earning 2.5% was not something people were excited about. Now that you could probably earn 5% tax-free, people are going to start, you know, purchasing these um, securities more and more. What was the, any other questions, Dr. Verma? Something I did not touch on, or if anyone has any questions, just because this topic is pretty extensive and it's pretty technical. It might be easier for me to answer questions than to put you guys through a whole list of rules and regulations. I guess a whole bunch of people like top of mind have, okay, so we're not Peter Thiel and Mm -hmm. we want to do slightly better than the 22,500 or whatever the contribution limit is. So I think, I think you mentioned some of the plans, a defined benefit plan, you can squirrel away a lot more money, but essentially you need to own your own practice. And if you have employees, then you have to give them a proportional percentage of something or another. So the other thing I've heard people doing is if they have independent contractor income, 1099 income, the, there's a higher contribution limit as well. You can open something like a SEP IRA or a yes. solo 401k. And now you can, if you earn enough income in the form of 1099 income, which is like the form you get for independent contractor work, you can put away $66,000, I think I heard. Yeah, so that's, so that, that's, that's total, that's like total contributions. Which would, if, so if you're contributing, let's say you have a 401k through work, that contribution gets included. It's not 66,000 for your SEP or solo 401k contribution. You have to combine all the contributions together. So the max is 66. But it also means part of that also includes any contributions that are made on your behalf, like matches. If you happen to work for someone who has a pension plan and they are contributing on your behalf, that gets included in that number as well. What Dr. Firmer was referring to, this is really important. And if you can, and you have the liquidity to do it, if you're doing contractor work, that puts you in like this awesome little category, especially if you have a a W-2 job where you're also, not only are you an employee with benefits and stuff, but you also are a business owner, uh, independent contractors, at least from the tax code, you own a business. So that money you can use towards contributions for your own pension plan. Now, caveat, the traditional pension plan is very expensive and it's also expensive to administer. There's something called a SEP account. It's a simplified, I think it was a simplified employee pension plan, which just means it's your own pension plan and you can contribute above the 6,500 contributions. Yeah, you can do up to 66 for 2023. Now it doesn't mean you have to do that much, but you can. The SEPs become tricky if you later on have your own business and you actually have employees because then you will have to start contributing the same portion for them. What that means is let's say you're contributing 20% of your self-employed income to your SEP account and you hire an assistant, you will also need to contribute 20% of that person's salary into their pension account. They do not contribute at all. The only contributions in pension plans are employer contributions and it will be required. As long as it's just you, the SEP accounts are awesome. Once you start having employees, not so awesome because you're obligated to make the same sort of contributions. The other one is the solo 401k. And those are really awesome because they are structured in a way where it's just the 401k for you. 
any spouse can participate in the solo 401k as well. When they were structured, they were put together to minimize administration fees. All of these big accounts like 401ks, 403bs, pension plans, they cost a lot of money, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars a year just to administer. The solo 401k, there are companies that do it. I believe um, Fidelity has it. There are some standalone companies that offer solo 401ks, very easy to set up. It was not like that in the past. Those are also an account, a type of account that you can open and use your self-employed income towards contrib contributing every single year. But like I said, if you have the retirement plan at work and you open this account on the side, those contributions are aggregate. They're not separate. If you're doing 20 in one, then you would subtract 20,000 from your contributions that you'll be making to a pension plan or solo 401k. And, and the solo 401ks are tax deferred, right? Like you can take a deduction this year and pay taxes yes. later. You can take a deduction. Yes, you can take a deduction in the solo 401k. I don't know. I haven't seen solo 401ks that have both options, traditional and Roth. They may be available now, but yes. And there is also, I don't know if you still in place. I know it was last year. The IRS gives you credits for opening these accounts. The government really wants you to figure out your own retirement. If you pay administration fees for these accounts, you essentially get a credit for the fees that you make. I think you get it for like the first three years up to $5,000, something like that. If you do set up one of these accounts and there's any administration fees, it's a, it's a credit for on your taxes. Okay. I don't have any specific questions now does anyone else have any questions or i know the defined benefits and defined contributions plans are just like incredibly complicated so i don't know anything yeah. about this your 401k is a defined contribution plan so oh, okay any sort of retirement account where the contributions are defined yeah. right that's a defined contribution plan if someone hears this recording and has a more complicated situation people open retirement accounts for their kids. There's all sorts of ways to leverage retirement accounts, but that gets complicated. Yeah. And there's also, there also seems to, it's funny you bring up kids. Like I also see a lot of misinformation online, like people opening up like Roth IRAs for their kids. Yeah. And it needs to be like earned income. You can't <laughs> just pay a two-year-old in yes. your medical practice because if you get audited, probably they're not going to believe you that baby was doing paperwork and there's state specific laws as well. I live in New Jersey. I looked this up the other day. I think it's like age 14 or something, even for mm -hmm. paper. Everyone's opinions are all over the place. Some people have aggressive accountants. I've heard people talk about setting up 401ks for their kids and paying the modeling income for their social media feeds and stuff. I, you have to talk to your own tax professional and accountant to see whether that would hold up in court. I don't know. It depends what your type of business is and what the fair market value of taking one picture a month for 12 Instagram posts. Does it really add to, I, I don't know, but. Yeah. I, I always say the rule of thumb is, do you believe it? Yeah. Do you believe this six-year-old was filing? And not only that, you have to pay them a real wage. You cannot just pay them a ridiculous amount of money, whether too small or too big, because it becomes really apparent when you do it, because what happens is people usually pay their kids exactly the amount of the contribution. So they're not going to pay above that because the whole point is you're trying to leverage this account. So it becomes really clear when folks try to do these things and it's not worth what could happen if you get caught and can't defend it in an audit. Yeah. And again, people have different businesses. I guess if you legitimately have some sort of social media empire where it makes money off selling stock images or something of kids, then maybe you can do it. But Dr. Shah is going to say something. Go ahead. Or did was it an accidental hand raise, maybe? Yeah. No, sorry. No, I was going to say you can pay your kids to draw on your walls and call interior designing. No, we're living that dream right now. <laughs> One question is might be, I think it's relevant, but it's also probably more advanced. Let's say you have a trust. Assigning beneficiaries 
to this trust, but then looking down the road in terms of estate planning, any advice in terms of how you could use that trust and then the beneficiaries and the retirement plans put under that trust as a tax shelter of any sort or anything that could be done for a generation down the road? Retirement accounts have their own rules in terms of beneficiaries and tax structure. What people usually do, the trust won't hold. The retirement account will have the trust usually as a beneficiary. And what that does is that then you ensure that the beneficiaries, like that distribution happens exactly the way you want it in the trust. Doing these things do not escape you from income tax like at all. So there's income tax and then there's estate tax. Trusts are tools to manage the estate tax. They can, they do nothing for your income tax. You could trust it all you want. They're gonna have income tax. Now, since we're on the topic of beneficiaries, do not leave your children as beneficiaries on your retirement accounts, please. If they're under 18, big pain in the butt. You shouldn't have your children as beneficiaries on anything if they're under age unless you have set up a trust for them and that money is going directly to a trust. It's a big hassle if, God forbid, something happens to you and then you have to distribute this account because children cannot inherit funds directly. They will need to have a guardian issued by the court. It's usually the parent, but the parent, everybody's lives are complicated. Sometimes you may not want that parent as the guardian, especially not a financial guardian, it makes things really complicated if you leave your kids as beneficiaries. The other thing is that there's, how do I explain this without it being complicated? There are rules in terms of who the beneficiary is. For example, Dr. Verma puts his wife as the beneficiary of his retirement account. Awesome strategy. The reason why is because she, your wife, then gets to inherit this account and not be forced to distribute or pay any taxes on it. Only spouses have this rule. If you leave your money to your children, your retirement account specifically, they will be forced to distribute that account into a certain amount over a certain amount of time and pay taxes on it. It is not advisable to put children as your beneficiaries for both of those reasons. And putting the trust as a beneficiary and then having it distributed accordingly. If it turns out that your children are one of the direct beneficiaries, then yes, they will still have to pay the income tax and make the distributions. Thank you for the explanation. That actually really helps. Yeah, and that, that spouse rule, it's just a spouse. It can't be a boyfriend, your mother, your sister, your brother, anybody that's not a spouse does not have that privilege of inheriting a retirement account and continuing that deferred or tax-free status. The only exception to that rule is if you were over, now it's 73. If you were over 73 and you started taking your required minimum distributions, then those distributions will have to continue for your spouse because you were in distribution mode. And the IRS is very serious about getting their tax money. They'll find a way to get it. All right. So that was a lot of information. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, uh, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Distribution. If you have a retirement account, whether you do these distributions before 59 and a half or after, the difference is you're going to have an extra 10% if you're under 59 and a half. You have to be really careful because these distributions can jump you into a higher tax bracket. So what that means is, let's say you're at a 25%, I'm just throwing numbers out here. Let's say you're at a 25% tax bracket and you're making $100,000. And then you make a distribution from your retirement account for $30,000. I'm not saying that these are the actual limits, but let's say that it were. If $100 put you in a higher tax limit, tax rate, all of your money is more taxable, not just that piece. <laughs> all of it is now 35 at a 35% tax rate not the 25 that you were at initially. I keep emphasizing getting help when it comes to these accounts or distributions or any sort of um, conversions. These are tax implications and you could end up owing a lot of taxes if you don't do things correctly. That's my last rant for the night. <laughs> all right, that was awesome. Thank you for all that information.
I always end with showing people on our website where they can find Tanya and book an appointment with her. Um, yes, and please do any questions you have, please book some time. I'll be happy to help. I don't know why my screen's gone blank. I'm trying to scroll down on the screen, but it's, if you just go to joinandwise.com and then go all the way down here and click on complimentary financial education and her Calendly link is right there. You can book some time for yourself. Thank you everyone for joining and our next community hour will be in two more weeks and we'll be talking about disability insurance for physicians at that time. And we'll see you then. Thanks everyone.